PCJ speaker series. Um, and welcome to those who are here for the first time. Um, we are in for what I think is a treat um, with uh, the Director of Science and Policy at Cure Violence Global, Charles Ransford. Um, Cure Violence has been on the uh, been top of mind for many of us for the past decade or so because of the work that they've been doing to reduce violence. And post uh, the murder of George Floyd, I think lots of people were thinking about alternative models to dealing with issues of, of violence and crime, generally speaking. Cure Violence kept showing up all across the media in terms of uh, thinking about um, different kinds of interventions that didn't necessarily have to rely so heavily on police. Um, I thought they would be an amazing contribution to uh, the, the series, um, along with my partner, Chris Winship, um, in sociology. Um, and that's because Cure Violence uh, meets young people where they are, um, establishing these relationships of trust, um, helping to shape the norms and attitudes of the people in, in communities that um, are struggling with issues of violence, intervening to head off problems before they escalate. Um, and evidence suggests that when cure, the cure violence model is adopted faithfully, the rates of shootings, killings, and other forms of violence decline significantly. I don't want to get ahead of myself because I'm sure that uh, uh, Mr. Ransford would like to share um, as much as possible about what cure violence does, but um, you should know that cure violence's model has led to 63% reduction in shootings in New York City, 73 up to 73% reductions in shootings um, in Chicago, 31% reductions in killings um, when their model has been adopted faithfully. In Baltimore, killings were down 36%, shootings down 34%. We also see reductions in a number of cities across the globe. Um, um, in Mexico, uh, South Africa, Honduras, um, et cetera. And the benefits of cure violence go well beyond um, reducing violence itself to other aspects of, uh, of, of the lives of community members. And I'm sure that Mr. Ransford will share about that. Um, again, Charles Ransford is the Director of Science and Policy at Cure Violence Global. Um, and he will be discussing the model, how it works, why it works. Uh, Mr. Ransford is a, a graduate of the Harris School uh, for Public Policy at the University of Chicago, my alma mater, um, and has previously worked for the U.S. Department of Justice. Um, uh, Mr. Ransford has decided to give a, a, a fairly brief presentation, and then we will uh, open it up for Q&A, although I will admit um, if I am so moved, I will probably throw out a few questions first before opening it up for the, the audience. I have many questions for Mr. Uh, Mr. Ransford about the cure violence model. So I want to welcome Mr. Uh, Ransford to the PCJ and I'm so much look forward to hearing your talk. Thanks very much for the invitation and for having me here. I, I've been looking forward to this very much. I look forward very much to the questions. I think that's a lot of times when a lot of interesting stuff comes out, but I think perhaps it uh, makes sense to start off just to set the table a bit with just an introduction of what it is that we do and how we do it and uh, and sort of how we go about it and how we understand things. Um, so, you know, the, the title here is Treating Violence as a Health Epidemic. That is how we come about this. That's the lens that we see this through. And that's, I think, a very important spot to start with. And so I'm going to spend a little time explaining that. But first, I think it's important just to kind of set the, the stage here with the problem that we're facing. It's it's a problem that's getting much, much worse. Cities, most cities have gone up considerably. Um, but even beyond that, it's been a, a long time problem. It's been a problem that, you know, I think deserves the kind of federal investment, the kind of federal leadership and attention that hopefully we'll see soon. Uh, but it's, it's lacked that for a long time. And so it's it, other problems that are at this level do get this kind of attention. So I think it's just important to understand that this is something that, that could be addressed and could be solved, but we're not doing it. And furthermore, I think when we talk health equity, violence is at the top of that list. Um, you know, violence is a problem that very much affects people of color at much, much higher rates. And so as you know, health equity is a priority, we need to look at violence at the top of that list of things to address. So in my presentation here, I just I kind of want you to consider three questions. Uh, first of all, why do people behave violently? Second, how can we best change behaviors and you know, specifically violent behaviors? And what role can you play? 
So just consider this for a minute before we, we launch and, and then I'll, I'll kind of go into these. So I want to just start, you know, right with the first question of how behaviors are formed. So fundamental to us addressing violence is kind of understanding where these behaviors are coming from. And the science, what it really shows us is that most human behaviors is learned through modeling. I mean, there's a variety of ways in which we take up behaviors, but most is learned through modeling, and this is because it's very efficient. And uh, it particularly violent behaviors are picked up through modeling. And there's you know, been various specific studies that have shown us this, uh, the Bobo Dao experiment that Bandura has done, but that role models exhibiting violent behaviors are picked up by children. And that's been shown by a number of other studies as well. But, you know, in addition to the modeling, we also have a code of the street. We have norms that really, it, it, it introduces a peer influence, that this is a way that you react to certain situations. If somebody disrespects you, this is what is expected in response. That if this happens, if somebody does something violent to you that you don't wanna be seen as weak, you don't wanna be the next target, so you have to act a certain way. And this really drives a lot of the violent behavior in communities that we work in. And then I think it's important to point out that there's a lot of emotional aspects as well. Uh, you know, if violence was done, on, done to you uh, or somebody you loved, uh, you would feel these emotions. You'd want, maybe a lot of us would want revenge. Um, you know, if somebody close to us was killed, this, these are sort of natural human emotions that we would go through. And then there are times when, you know, we're in places, people are at places where, you know, these individuals might not be violent people. They might not think of themselves as violent, as violent people, but they're in a situation where the violence around them creates a situation where they themselves are acting violently. And then on, on top of all of that, there's also sort of the trauma that happens when people are exposed to violence. There's PTSD. Uh, you know, we, the term PTSD comes a lot from the, the war experiences, but in communities, we really talk about ongoing uh, exposure. There's no post involved. So it's really ongoing traumatic stress disorder. Just to remind ourselves what trauma is, it's you know, it's an event that happens or a series of events that happen to you that has harmful and long lasting effects on your functioning, you know, your, your social functioning, your emotional functioning, your overall well being. And the way that this manifests when you're exposed to violence is a lot of times you're hyper vigilant, you're quick to respond, you, you know, there are, there are perceived threats that are reminders. And so the, all of these things lead to you being much more likely to respond violently. You're much more looking for that next thing because you've been sort of trained through trauma to expect that and be on guard for that. So why do people behave violently? Well, there's a lot of explanations for this. There's the copying, there's modeling, and there's a social pressure. There's the, the emotional cues, the emotional things of wanting revenge or being caught up. And then there's the trauma that really drives more aggressive behaviors when you've been exposed to it. So all of this, what, what all of this is, is pointing to is is this sort of, there's a means of transmission. We're being exposed to violence, we're taking it in visually, and it's, it's disrupting a specific organ of our body. It's disrupting the way that our brain acts. This is very much how diseases act. It's instead of disrupting the functioning of our stomach, our lungs, it's, it's disrupting the functioning of our brain. And so it really is fun, it, it, it's, it's operating very much like an epidemic disease here. It's based on exposure. And there are modulating factors that determine whether you pick up this behavior, but, and, and a lot of these factors are the same, their age, their type of exposure, the dose that you received. But, and, and by the way, this also happens across types of violence, uh, whether it's community violence, violence in the home, suicide, all these types of violence, it really leads to these same sort of uh, reactions to you. you. You pick up the behavior, you model it, you're traumatized by it and more aggressive because of it. So all this is showing that, and there's a lot of evidence showing this, that there's much, uh, much evidence showing that the exposure to violence is leading people to perpetrate violence, whether it's child abuse, whether it's in the community, whether it's uh, the wartime violence. So essentially it's exposure to violence, it's leading to more violence. So we have a relationship like this, that the exposure is leading that individual then to either maybe retaliate, or maybe they're traumatized and are more aggressive, but they're spreading the violence. This is an epidemic health problem. So what we're seeing with violence is 
that people that are experiencing violence are spreading it in the same way that epidemics spread. Uh, and then once those, once they spread to the next individuals, they set, they, they, uh, they go on spreading this problem. And so the way to stop this is by stopping that transmission. And when you cut off the transmission, you cut off that chain reaction of people being traumatized down the line. And there's specific methods of stopping epidemics. And this is what the method for cure violence is, but it's important to reflect that this is the way that we stop other epidemics. Uh, this is how countries that have been successful at stopping COVID, this is what they've done, essentially. Um, you know, this, it's, it's hard to imagine in the US because we've, we've had a lot of failure when it comes to COVID, but when it comes to other epidemic problems, this is how we address it. When it comes to tuberculosis or other or HIV AIDS, this is the method that is used. You interrupt the transmission, you, the people that currently have the problem, you stop them from spreading it to other people. People that are at risk of getting the problem, you address that risk and you lower their risk. And then any sort of norms that encourage people being put at risk, you change those norms. So we can imagine what these are for COVID. It's the you know, norms are around mask wearing, interrupting transmission, they're identifying and, 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 uh, and telling people what their diagnosis is so they don't spread it and isolating them and preventing future spread. That's really taking the at-risk people. That's uh, you know nurses or nursing homes or things like this. So you know, this is how we stop epidemics. And this is the outline that we use for stopping violence as an epidemic. So first, interrupting transmission. So there are people that have conflicts that are ongoing in the community, in communities across the country right now. These are people that could be spreaders of violence. That conflict could become violent. Maybe it was a shooting that happened that they want to retaliate for. Maybe it was a robbery that happened the night before. Maybe somebody was disrespected in some way. There is that conflict that could become violence if it's not stopped. And so we have violence interrupters who it's their job to go out and detect these things. So they spend a lot of their time out on the street detecting, talking to people, spending their time on the street corners that they know are hot, talking to people about what happened last night, talking to people about who's coming out of prison, who's challenging certain territories, whatever the problems of that particular community are, they're there in the community, sniffing it out, trying to figure out where that next conflict is. And then they're trained in how do you interrupt this? There are various methods of cooling people down, validating their concerns to make sure that they're not gonna retaliate, distracting them with new ideas or just reframing it. So we train in this and the people that we put out to detect, they also know how to interrupt these conflicts as well. And then we also go to places we know where there might be a, a likely retaliation, hospitals. Maybe uh, you know people that are shooting victims, we train people to work in hospitals so that they can prevent retaliations from happening. And then we also detect on social media. Uh, a lot of our sites are now using uh, social media accounts to detect. Uh, they have keyword searches that bring up certain types of things that maybe something is happening within their district that they can respond to. And then they meet the people in person and try to defuse a situation. So they're really doing everything they can to detect and then interrupt that conflict. Next, you look at the people that are most likely to behave violently, and then you work with them to reduce their risk. And so we look specifically at the community that we're working in. We do an assessment of who's committing the violence right now, what's the history of this. We develop a list of criteria, and then every client that we take on, every outreach worker has a client load of about 15 people. We look at that list and determine whether this is a high risk person. And so one of the things that really differentiates the cure violence approach is that we're able to get to a much, much higher risk level because we're super focused not on people with drug problems, not on people that need a job, although you know, a lot of the people that we work with have both of those problems, but we're focused only on the people most likely to commit violence. Uh, and so we really spend all of our time on that and assessing that, looking at it every day, every week, assessing whether we have the right clients whether we're missing anybody, and if we are missing them, how we can get to them. And then last is about norm change. And so, you know, a lot of times violence in communities goes unchecked, it goes unnoticed. Uh, we point out that this is not acceptable. We have events, we have marches. Um, we also have meetings among people that are high risk or friends of people among high risk or relations or girlfriends of people at high risk. And we just try to walk the norms back. We try to have it. A lot of times what happens is people have 
an idea in their head about what's expected of them, but their friends actually don't expect that. They actually would be okay with them standing down at times. And so we, it's, it's good to have this discussion about what is expected, when is it okay to back down, what are the rules of engagement, you know, can we say no shootings in playgrounds, where can we draw this line to have new sets of norms where violence is not acceptable. And then all of this is done with credible messengers. And I, you know, I think this is a, a movement in this line of work of violence prevention that has really taken off. And I think a lot of approaches now are doing credible messengers. They're hiring people from the right background, from the same communities, people that understand the work. But uh, you know, this is something that I think, even when there's that attention to the idea of credible messengers, it's also kind of really hard to get it exactly right because it's not as simple as, the same community and the same demographic background. It's not as simple as somebody that has an arrest record. It's what it really comes down to is credibility and influence with the people that are, are most, most likely to commit violence. And so that is, it really takes a sort of expertise of having done this work, of knowing what kind of person and knowing how to recognize that sort of influence. Um, and so a lot of what we do as a, as a technical assistance provider we will go out on the streets with people uh, before they're hired and we'll see how people react to them on the streets. We'll see whether they're respected and whether they actually have influence. And you know, we're not going to put people on the streets who aren't going to be able to actually get the work done. And that's really, I think, a key part of, of the difference of, of why we're able to get results. And then like this work is all done by local community organizations. It's done by people in the community, local people in the community. Uh, you know, it's, it's not, uh, you know, we are a national, international organization, but we just provide guidance and training. The work is owned locally, it's uh, implemented locally, and it's, uh, it's, it's adapted locally. And we very much are sort of taking a public health approach to this. We use data strategically to target the approach, to look at hotspots. This is something that we do on a continual basis. We do it every day. There's a debriefing every week. There are debriefings because situations change. And I think this is another area where a lot of people get it wrong. You can't just put a cookie cutter approach and sit back and expect it to work. Situations on the ground are always changing. And so you need to one, be always assessing it, always looking at the data, always having debriefings and conversations. But you also need that outside perspective because when you're wrapped up in the problem, when you're really on the streets and you're dealing with the day-to-day, -day, you sometimes need that outside perspective to, to, to identify things that you're missing. Uh, the care violence approach has a lot of independent evaluations. This is another thing that really separates our work. These are independent evaluations. It's sometimes done by people that have been previous critics of our program, but, we've, uh, but they have done uh, studies of our work and found it to be very effective. Um, here are a few of the results that we've had. Um, you know, as as, as their introduction said, when this is implemented correctly, it works. It works very well when you get large reductions. It's important, obviously, to implement it correctly. Just like with medication, you can't mess with the ingredients of a medication and expect it to work. You have to get this approach right. We've also been able to adapt this to a lot of different situations. You know, in Mexico, we're dealing with cartels. We're dealing with different situations. Uh, in Trinidad and Cape Town, these are much different situations of poverty that we don't have in the U.S. Uh, and then, you know, in, in places in Canada, we've also been on Indian reservations. Uh, we've implemented this in a prison in U.K. So the same approach can be adapted to different types of environments and situations. Here's another example of some of the results that we get. In Chicago, we, it was found that we eliminated retaliations in the most of the communities that we worked in. So this is one of the big drivers of violence in communities. There's a previous act of violence that's being retaliated for. And when you implement this program correctly, you can stop the retaliations from happening because those are just so easy to predict and you could put people in the spots to, to cool people down. And not only do we get reductions, but some communities go long periods of time, a year or more without any violence, without any shootings, really able to transform that community completely from something where violence is expected to something where the last uh, act of violence you don't, you don't remember. This is a map of our, our current, uh, where, currently where we're working and where we're looking to expand to. Uh, you can see the concentration is really in the US, 
in Latin America. Uh, we are we're trying to get some pro programs off the ground in uh, the Middle East, and we have worked there previously, uh, but th those are the areas that we're focusing on. In the US, uh, there's our current footprint. Uh, right now, there is just an incredible demand. Uh, I think in the next month, we are visiting six different cities. Our teams are looking to implement the approach. So there's a high demand right now, and actually, it's frankly, it's more demand than we can really handle because it's such intensive work. Um, I mentioned the adaptations. We, we work on a number of different uh, types of violence. Uh, in addition to what I mentioned, we've also worked in schools. We worked on extremist violence in Morocco and other places. And uh, we've also worked in conflict zones. We've worked in Iraq and we've worked in Syria. And this is uh, an example of the results of the, the UK prison program. You can see that five out of eight months, we uh, stopped all group attacks, which was a serious problem in that prison previously. Um, you know, what sets the cure violence approach apart from other approaches? I mean, I think really it's the top three, th three things here. It's we've been evaluated a number of times, seven times that show that we can not only replicate the model, but we can get large, large statistically significant reductions. And we've had a lot of experience of doing this, of not only implementing it, but of replicating it, of doing the trainings. We've developed a lot of trainings. We have a lot of experience at, at what goes wrong and how to avoid that. So before I, I go to the q and I just I want to return to this and, and the person that I circled because I think it's what I think is needed in this field and what is needed in our communities is really just a re-understanding of this person here. The person who has been exposed. How do we want to treat this person? How do we want to see this person? Uh, you know, the person who's been exposed, maybe it's COVID, maybe it's HIV AIDS, or, or maybe it's violence, and they are being affected by it. Do we want to treat this person with suspicion and, and threats and fear? Or do we want to heal this person, understanding that there's a trauma? Do we want to heal this person and meet this person with care? It's really, it's taking this trip away from blaming the person, fearing, calling them thugs, Away, and even away from this idea of bad choices, that it's a, you know, you're, you're a good person, but you're making bad choices, and fully understand this as a contagious process. That their exposure to violence, their trauma, it's holding them back, it's hurting them, and we as a community can heal that, and can, we can do something about that before the police ever need to get involved. It's really about looking at things through a health lens and framing things different not talking about this as a problem of gangs and thugs and homicides, which by the way is a crime, not a, a behavior. Getting away from this sort of discussion of things and getting into talking about it a bit differently, talking about exposure and health, how we talk about it, that is how we will then will respond to it. So if we're talking about a gang problem, if we're talking about homicides, we're gonna be talking about police responses. So we really need to be thinking and talking about this as trauma, as behavior, as exposure, as a health problem. And that is what we can do to, to really kind of reframe this in a way and get back to really understanding this individual differently and asking ourselves, what kind of community do we want? And what kind of, uh, what kind of way do we want to, to deal with this individual? But also like, if we were this individual, how would we want to be dealt with? If we had a behavior problem, of any sort, how would we want to be met with to, to change that behavior? And I think we can all, we know the methods to do this in a more humane way. We know the methods to do this in a way that can heal people. It really just takes prioritizing that. So looking back at the three questions, why do people behave violently? How can we best change behaviors? And what role can you play? I, I think I've given us some perspectives on this from my perspective. And, and hopefully those perspectives make some sense to you and, and hopefully you've learned a bit about uh, ways that we can really turn around this violence problem. Here's our website and my email address. I welcome emails from anybody. So please reach out if you have any questions. So thank you very much for that. Um, we already are uh, accumulating lists in the chat, um, which we will get to shortly. I have a a couple of questions and then I'll see if Chris has a few questions that he might want to ask. 
Um, so my first question is um, about about the changing of norms. I'm kind of interested in if there is a, a, a tipping point, um, like how many people must be engaged um, in such a way that ends up having um, an effect on the, the community's norms around violence. Um, do you have some sense about when this tipping point occurs such that you feel like, okay, we are on the, we are on the right side of this curve? Um, can you tell us more about that? Yeah, so I mean, this is like, like, first of all, I want to point out, this is like the kind of exact questions that I want our research communities to be asking, because like improving upon each of these elements of the program are what's needed. And so figuring out these tipping points and at what point and do you, do you increase things or decrease things? These are the kind of things that we're asking. The, the truth is that we haven't exactly been able to answer your specific question because what's happening is cities are typically addressing violence with programs where they, they look at cure violence as a program where we're gonna implement this one approach in this one community as opposed to looking at it as an approach where this is how we're approaching violence as a city and we're going to address it as an epidemic throughout the city. And so what we end up happen, having is pockets of addressing violence as an epidemic and then out of control epidemics surrounding these pockets. And so you can't ever answer this question about tipping point because it's surrounded by um, places that are, are influencing that. But to say a bit more about like how we change norms, in my conversations with people I work with, one of the things I'm struck by is that it's, it's really, I think a lot of times it's, the staff themselves that are really setting this new norm. That it's the example that we, you know, we hire a particular person to play these roles as outreach workers and interrupters, and they truly are influential. In some cases, they were, you know, well-respected people on the other side of the law for a long time. And so people listen to them and they see, you know, he's turned his life around and this is what he's saying we need to do. And he's saying, it's okay if I do that instead of this it gives people an out if it's somebody who's respected. And a lot of times that's all that a lot of people need is just an out that, you know, it's okay for me to back down that because he said it's okay. And, and, and a lot of our workers give that. Um, another thing I would say is the evaluation in New York City, the John Jay evaluation, uh, they did a survey on norms. And so they found that we actually did shift norms that people in our communities were uh, less likely to endorse the use of violence for both serious and, and petty offenses. Uh, they, they also showed that um, police community relations improved, that people are more likely to interact and to, and to rely on the police. And it's, I know from talking to the researchers that they really, it's their theory of change that this is really driving the reduction in violence, that they can see right away that we're reducing the, uh, the, the, that we are changing these norms related to violence and people are rejecting violence in certain situations. And they think that this is what leads the change. And so I think, but getting to your exact question of where is that tipping point, this is what we need to be finding and what we need to be researching and funding uh, because it's possible to get there. We can get there in small situations like in a prison, we can get there in small cities uh, but we haven't really been able to answer the questions about like, when do we get there and how do we know we're there and, and what, you know, what are people doing differently and what's important, what's not important. So it's a lot of it is, I think, still a research question. So I, I, I've um, been taken by uh, the way that the success of the program tends to be described, and that's in terms of how the model is adopted faithfully versus unfaithfully. And, you know, perhaps not surprisingly, unfaithfully means that you don't achieve the same kinds of results. And one review that I read said, suggested that there was one or a, a, um, a small number of contexts where things actually looked like they got worse. What have you learned from um, cases where you weren't able to shift things considerably and maybe there are very few cases where things seem to actually get worse. Um, what, to the extent that you know what happened in those contexts that then had you rethink aspects of your model, your intervention? Yeah, so, um, I mean, first of all, any time where there's not been a result or where there's been a, uh, a negative result, 
the evaluators have always pointed out the ways in which they did not implement the model correctly. And we have, do, you know, we've documented, th these are cities that weren't working with us. Like this wasn't us working with a city and then it wasn't done right. They, these are people that have gone on their own and, and tried to do it and they've gotten some things wrong. And there, there are a few things that are typically, typically gotten wrong um, when people try to do this on their own. Um, and there are also people that have done it successfully, by the way, too. I mean, it's not to say that we're the only ones that know how to do this. I think there's a lot of examples of successful implementations. Um, you know, I look at the work being done in Newark, I think is very promising. The work in Los Angeles has been very impressive. So there's a lot of examples of people getting it right. And both of those places have, uh, you know, been partners look, working with us, learning from us together. Um, but when people get it wrong, I think one of the things that happens is, first of all, you start to lose your focus on who you're working with. Um, it's, it's in a community where there's just such high need, where people, there's a lot of problems. Uh, it's so easy to just, you know, you, you're inundated with people needing a job or needing, you know, a treatment or needing whatever assistance that they might need. It's just, it's really hard to maintain that focus because you want to help as many people as you can. But when you only have five or seven workers who are devoted for a community of several thousand people, and there's, by the way, hundreds of people that fall in the category of high risk, you really have to stay focused. And so it's, it's hard to maintain that focus. I think having outside te technical support really helps you get that right. If you happen to have a ton of resources and can just have dozens and dozens of outreach workers, then, then the job becomes a lot easier. But if you only have a handful of outreach workers and you really have to be targeted. Um, the other thing is, is people I think hire the wrong workers a lot of times. Um, it's, uh, you know, a lot of times we've, in the past we've seen people hire people that have previously worked for that particular community organization, or maybe they're friends or relations of the person who's running the program, or, you know, th these are typical things that are done in, in other settings and, and work. But in this particular setting, it's the, the level of respect and influence and credibility that you have to have is just so specialized that it's, you can't just hire anybody. It really has to be a particular person. Um, and, and yeah, you, you have to spend a lot of time making sure you get that part right. And a lot of people don't. And I mean, and then the other part is, um, I mean, the thing about public health is the, by design, you're always re-looking at the problem. You're always monitoring it and looking at the data and analyzing about what's working, what's not working. And so it's, it's by design, it's sort of not able to fail in a way because if you're, miss, if you're failing, you should be asking the questions about why you're failing and you should be making that adjustment. And so that's, you know, that's a lot of the role that we play is helping communities understand how to do that. By like looking at the data, we have a database that they plug into, we run reports for them on a weekly basis and we're talking to them all the time about things that they might be missing, about you know, workers that might need more clients or, or particularly you know, what happened to this particular shooting in their neighborhood. So it's, it's really doing this constant briefing, debriefing about what's happening in the community. And it's not just looking at data though. I mean, you know, there's sort of the big data of what's happening, but there's sort of the little data of what are you hearing on the street. And so it's just so important to get people together you know, you get the outreach worker talking to the interrupter about what did you hear? Oh, I heard something different. And then you start comparing stories and you start getting to the bottom of what's happening. And, you know, this is one of the things that just a lot of sites stop doing at some point, or they don't do it as much as they need to, because, you know, you're busy. You got, you got this client you're worried about, or you got to get on the streets to, to talk to people. It's easy to stop doing that sort of meeting but it's just so important because you have to exchange this information and really strategize on a continual basis. So um, I'm wondering about, I mean, you, you showed a slide earlier that uh, showed how much violence has increased across a number of cities in the US. Um, and so there are a couple of questions that I have all packed into one. Um, and how many of these cities or neighborhoods where care violence has done its work, has implemented it, this, its program, have we seen spikes? And to the extent that you have, what does that mean about the long-term impact of the program? Um, 
like generally speaking, how do you imagine the the, the level of engagement, the, the amount of time that um, care violence would engage? Is this a, an effort that has to be in place for a generation? Are we thinking two, three years? What are, what are we thinking for it to have an impact, an impact that doesn't just change, at least in the short term, how people think, but given that they're broader kind of structural context didn't change at all will likely <laughs> raise issues so that you would have to deal with it again later on. So the more recent context causes me to wonder, has cure violence's approach not mattered much in the in a situation where, you know, all hell has broken loose. It's not just COVID, it's also seeing all these images of black bodies being murdered and um, that would create, uh, I think, a kind of uh, disconnect, uh, kind of uh, would feed the disorder that we've seen. What role for cure violence in this situation? Um, can you share with me what you think has happened here? Yeah, so I think to start, um, in terms of like what's happening with the spike, uh, I mean, it's, I, I think it's too early to really know for sure. Uh, you know, I think as a statistician, reading statisticians, looking at data, this sort of thing really kind of, it's, it's hard to determine this early. Um, I, you know, I've seen various people, you know, frankly, criminologists who you know, unsurprisingly are pointing to policing, which I think is, you know, it's sort of like the hammer and nail sort of analogy where it's not surprising that criminologists point to policing uh, or a lack of policing or, or, or that sort of thing. Um, I, I can talk an anecdotally um, in terms of what people, uh, outreach workers and interrupters and program managers on, the, uh, managers on the street tell me. And I mean, I think it's a lot of what they say, first of all, is that it's, um, it's generally stress related to COVID and, and the economy. Uh, you know, there are people that are, you know, having to do things because they need to make ends meet um, in some instances. Um, and then just in general stress, I think, related um, it, it's important to note that epidemic, epidemic diseases and epidemic violence go hand in hand very often. There's a ton of examples of this in Africa, ton of examples in Latin America. It's very common for this to happen, and there are reasons for this. Um, but I mean, the other thing, I mean, more specifically, like what I'm hearing too is, uh, you know, when you have the lockdown, what that means is that certain places are closed down, you know, bars or rec centers or things. And so people congregate on the streets more and they're hanging out more and it just becomes a bit easier for things to happen. Uh, you know, you know where to find people. Um, and so a lot of things like I know in Chicago, the program manager that was working there, um, he was telling me that they would have instances where people would just kind of drive at the end of the block and shoot down the street because they would know that there was, you know, they were having a party there at night or something and they would try to get at somebody. So. So you have a lot of things like that happening too. So I mean, COVID is definitely having a, a big effect. And so like, what does this tell us? I mean, first of all, um, you know, I, I think violence is going to spike at times of stress, whether it's economic, whether it's disease or whether it's something else uh, that happens. And we need epidemic control efforts in place to try to keep that from happening or just trying to keep the, the spike from happening as bad as it could be happening. I mean, that's what we're kind of seeing in our communities is that some are maintaining, some are going up a little bit, but they're not spiking as bad as other communities. Um, although, you know, there are isolated incidents where other, there are certain problems that we're having. But, um, but, you know, that happens when you have short staffs and when you have hugely stressful times and huge problems that they're dealing with. Um, I think, but I think more generally, you know, you're asking the question about amount of time, you know, how long do we have to fund this, this program to, to before we can back off and just go back to normal where we don't have violence. And, you know, I would, I would push you a little bit on that. And I, I think like this is also the difference between thinking about it as a program and thinking about it as an approach. Because to me, we, first of all, we know this can work. And so like, if you're in a situation where violence is increasing, we need to ask ourselves why it's increasing. Maybe it needs more resources. Maybe it needs more people on the streets. Maybe you're missing something. So I, I think we need, we know it can work. We need to just be asking why it's not working. But, you know, this is a new approach. This is addressing violence and addressing behavior as a health issue instead of a police issue. 
And so the vision of what happens is not that we implement a program and the problem goes away in two years and we back out and then we're just left with the regular policing scenario. The vision is that communities will be managing their own problems with their own outreach workers from their community, people that understand that are doing it from a place of health, from a place of healing, a place of helping instead of threats and punishment, that this is a new way of doing things. And so the idea is, is that this won't go away, that this will be the way we get ahead of problems so that police are needed less in a community and so that the problems are solved in different ways. And so, yeah, I think this is the new way, this is the new approach. And I, I would really hope that we would more fully fund this instead of other ways of going about problems. Um, I, I certainly do support the idea of funding um, programs like Cure Violence, um, especially when you see the evidence of it. But so much of what you just said also leads me, well, it doesn't lead me to believe because I've already thought this, that so much of what's happening here is a, that these are stresses often related to socioeconomic disadvantage, structural disadvantages that often last for generations. And if we were to invest in communities and provide supports, they, they on some level, at some point, they likely wouldn't need um, cure violence. They certainly don't need cure violence in the community that I li live in because we all are, can take care of ourselves, can live our lives um, and, um, and thrive. And if we were to support the, the communities that your, many of your efforts are um, unfolding in, perhaps cure violence, we, we wouldn't need it. I'm glad that it exists given that we are not supporting communities in that way, but it would seem like the more, uh, uh, um, I, I would prefer to live in a world where we didn't need cure violence because we were supporting these communities. And that seems to be the, one of the things that we should be focusing or supporting as well. Um, providing key supports, whether income supports, building up institutions so that people feel stable, they feel secure, um, and the stresses related to the vagaries of a, a capitalist economy and other sorts of things don't have to, um, I'm, I'm assuming that you get that a lot, um, or at least to some extent, that so much of what you are addressing are the ills um, for folks who are often deeply impoverished, et cetera. How do you tend to respond to that? Well, I would say, first of all, um, violence is this primary problem that, um, you know, unlike other problems, violence affects all these other issues in community. That, uh, you know, schools are failing, we invest a ton in schools, but if there's violence in those schools, uh, you can only do so much. It's a barrier to further progress in schools. Um, if you have kids that are fearful in a learning environment, there's only so much you can do. Business districts uh, uh, are supporting business of color, I mean, there's only so much you can do if, it's, if there's violence in that community. I mean, a lot of these things are needed, um, but the point I'm making is that we can stop violence right now. There are things that we can do right now to stop violence that can make all these other things a lot more possible. A school without violence has a lot more opportunities to succeed than one with violence. And so, uh, so I, was, you know, I, I think, yes, we need to do both. And, and we, we most especially need to immediately do the violence one uh, because, uh, because we can do something about that. We know exactly what we need to do. We know how to stop that. We know how, you know, we know ways in which, you know, I, one of the things I was thinking about is like the curve that we're used to seeing for COVID. And, you know, we, for a long time, we were on this idea of bend the curve. And, and we unfortunately didn't do that. And other places did do that. And so, you know, this is the sort of the sort of vision I have where it's just like, we could continue to let this out of control violence epidemic go. And then there's all of these victims that have happened, but we can address it right now while we're getting everything else in place, while we're solving other, the other problems as well. And we're saving a lot of lives and we're also making it a lot easier to solve these other problems. So to me, it's violence is the primary thing we need to address right now while we're trying to solve these other problems, it's gonna make everything a lot easier if we do it that way. Well, hopefully um, in the process uh, of allowing cure violence to do its work in multiple communities, uh, the state and other organizations, agencies will come in and provide that support. 
I just don't know that that will happen because it's failed to happen for the last 50 some odd years. Um, and it could be the case that by reducing violence in the way that care violence has done in many locations, it relieves the pressure so that folks, uh, those in power don't feel like they have to. Uh, they might be suffering under poverty, et cetera, but they're not killing each other or being a threat to anyone else. So who, who cares? Um, so it, it's an interesting, I think, uh, um, irony. I'm going to uh, pass it along. I mean, can I just respond real quick to that? Okay. I mean, I, the thing is, is, I mean, I would really love for you to meet some of our outreach workers and violence interrupters because these people are voices for the community. And I mean, in a real genuine sense that, you know, they're not only dealing with violence, you know, the people that are violent, the people that have violence in their lives that are acting violently, they have a lot of problems. And so the people that are helping them, help them deal, you know, they take them to the office to deal with their, you know, their, their you know, whatever issue, their drug treatment or getting a job or getting a GED. So they're involved, very actively involved, and they understand the problems that are going on in their communities. And a lot of times they are actively the ones who can speak up. And so I, you know, I think the role of the violence interrupter and the outreach worker, although it's hyper-focused on violence, they're also leaders in the community. And I think investing in these leaders in the community can play a huge role that, you know, once you get the violence under control, these are voices that are gonna be able to point out the other problems and be able to get attention to those other problems too. So it's really, it is investing in leaders as well in the community. Um, so Chris, any questions? That you know. Now we have enough, several of them. I guess I would also make the point is I think in a society we have, have not cared so much about homicides in the inner city. Um, think about ghetto sides. Detailed look at LA. So are there um, contexts of cities um, where cure violence works best and others in which it's not as effective? Any sense of why? Uh, there's a set of factors that we look at for why we would go to a city or not go to a city. Um, I mean, first of all, they have to have a serious problem. Uh, you know, places that have, you know, homicide rate that might be under 10 or so. Uh, you know, these aren't places that we're very interested in going to. Um, I think they also, they, you know, you need to have resources in the community. Uh, I mean, our outreach workers aren't magically making problems go away they're helping connect people to services that are there in the community. And so if this community has no services, it becomes a lot more difficult. Now we do work in some places like Honduras where you know, th that's very difficult and there aren't those services, but, um, but typically that's something that we look at. Um, you know, we, we've worked in a variety of locations in terms of rural, uh, mid-sized, small cities, large cities. Um, we've worked in, institutions, we've worked in a uh, number of different countries. So, I mean, I, I'd like to say it's possible anywhere, but I mean, I think that the biggest thing that holds places back is the, um, the commitment of the stakeholders. Are they committing funding, not just for one year, but for three to five years at least? Um, and, and then like the, the geographic footprint, like are we able to get in enough of the city to really get on top of the problem or are other areas of the city going to, to create problems for us? So, I mean, these are some of the places, things that we look at, but, um, but yeah, we really tried it in a number of situations and, and found that we were able to get results in, in pretty much all different types. Okay, well, I think you've already answered my question, but uh, do you know much about the Boston Street Safe Program, which I was one of the evaluators? It shares a lot of the stuff that Seems I do. Yeah, I, I saw the presentation. Ended up finding no effect. Of course, Boston is not a above ten for a city. It's a, a city with you know relatively low, low rates of, of violence. And maybe that, maybe it's the wrong model for that, that kind of context. Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, you know, New York obviously doesn't either. But we work in pockets where there are bigger places potentially. I mean, I'm familiar with. The model, but not not enough to really get myself in too deep talking about it. But I think there are important differences, uh, just in how I, I know that they were more embedded in the gang, which is sort of maybe the more the older approach of doing outreach. Um, so I mean, I think there's different there are differences in approach, and uh, you know the the people that I I work with that have, you know that have been doing this for 15 years or more. Um, what they tell me is 
a lot of it is just kind of a lot of these little differences about how you come together and strategize. And so it's, it's, although things might look on paper to be very similar, if they're not doing some of these little things, it, it really just makes all the difference. And they're not necessarily hard, they're not hard things, but they're, and they're things that people know, so they feel like they know what to do, uh, but it, it is kind of hard to do continually and know how to do it on, on a regular basis on your own. Why don't we turn it over to the audience, uh, Sandra? Okay, that sounds good. Um, Linda Robeson. Um, Linda, why don't you ask your question? And so if not Linda, um, Lauren Honigman asks, is there buy-in from the people that you're targeting? I'm assuming there has to be, otherwise you probably wouldn't be in the community, but is there, is there buy-in and how is buy-in achieved? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's achieved through credibility, essentially. Um, I, mean, I mean, in terms of buy-in, I mean, first of all, when we go to a city, obviously it needs to be funded, so you need the, the political buy-in or at least foundation buy-in. But you also need sort of stakeholder buy-in, so, you know, clergy and other leaders in the community. Um, the buy-in of, of people in the community who are, who are clients, that's actually fairly simple because we're hiring people that they know, you know, that's... It's somebody's uncle that you've hung out with for all your whole life, or, or if you don't know them, then you know somebody that knows them. So, so buy-in's not easy, and um, yeah, in fact, it's it's more than just buy into the program. It's wow, this guy's doing this. If if he's doing it, then not only is my buy into the program that it's just I see a way out of what I'm doing. Maybe I need to be thinking about what I'm. So it's it's more than buy-in. It's to the approach. It's buy into a way out. Um, so I mean, it's. And you really, we hire people that can do that. And that's what we look for. Okay. So Linda says that I can share her, her question. She wants to know more about your data collection um, and how you've gathered uh, evidence uh, that these strategies are working. Yeah, so I mean, we have a our own proprietary database that has a number of measures. I mean, we're tracking a lot of program inputs. Uh, you know, for every mediation that happens, there's a form that they fill out that has various aspects of the mediation. Uh, for every client, you know, there's forms that they fill out on a regular basis to track that client and, and what they're doing with that client. Uh, yeah, we, we track all aspects of home visits and events that they're doing. So a lot of those inputs. Um, and, then, um, and then, you know, on the other side, you know, we're the sites that we work with, they always get police data or other data that can tell them about the shootings that are happening in their communities. So we get shooting data and homicide data to check about whether or not these you know, approaches are being successful or what's happening. Uh, on, on the evaluation side, um, I mean, it's, it's truly independent and we give them access to our, da our database. So they're looking at all of our inputs, but they get their own uh, output data. And, you know, like in New York City, they got some police data, but then they also got uh, emergency room data or hospital data to look at uh, violent injuries. And so those are typically what evaluators look at is either crime data or hospital injuries. And to me, it's really fascinating too. I spent some time with the evaluators in New York, just looking at the differences in the data of, of hospital admissions versus crime data, which, you know, crime data, you have the person's address and hospital admission, you have their location of injury. And so, you know, like, we're, we're supposed to be dealing with our target area. And so we're deal with people that live there, but we also deal with things that happen there. And so it's just, it's really, I think an interesting uh, intervention question about what's the right data source? Who are you really trying to affect? Is it people there that live there or just people that are visiting there? And how do you do that? And yeah, it just, I mean, actually data sources can open up a whole bunch of questions like that. So I'm gonna allow, if she's ready, Magella. Vanderwerf to uh, ask her own question. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm a, a youth violence practitioner. I've worked in Central America, very familiar with cure violence, and I had the privilege to spend almost a year with Roca Baltimore. And I have a question, um, and I think you spoke a little bit to this, but I'm curious to hear a bit more if you can, on kind of the systems level, because one of the linchpins of your work, as you've been describing, is to really work at that level. And I wonder if in cities like Baltimore and others where, where there also is a, a manifestation of trust receding with, with perpetual generations of violence, what you see at that level, like where 
you know, what, what does it take to, to get that to work properly at the systems level? And, and what kind of role does that play in your successes as you're seeing uh, replication in all of these contexts? Thank you. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, system level change and, and sort of like approaching this uh, uh, differently from a system level is sort of something we've been working on for the last five years um, from an advocacy sort of standpoint. But, you know, this is not something that we've necessarily seen play out in policy very much. Um, we're starting to work with some cities about doing things differently in schools, about looking at violence uh, as a health issue in schools and prisons and healthcare settings. Uh, but, you know, we're really just kind of at the stage of having this idea and having people be open to this idea. I think, you know, I've been amazed at where this field has come in the last five years, frankly. Um, I remember the last election cycle, um, you know, there were no candidates talking about violence as a public health issue. And this time they all did um, on, on, in the primaries, they all did. Um, and, you know, I think, um, you know, five years ago, there were a handful of people in this space currently doing outreach in, in this sort of health-based approach or community-based approach. Now there are dozens of, of different approaches, different organizations. There's several in one city. Baltimore has several. Chicago has several. And so, I, you know, this, this field has definitely changed. And so I think, you know, as, as recently as five years ago, this idea of system was system change and, and sort of system level approach change was a, it was a brand new idea that nobody really even understood. And so I think like now where we're just finally kind of getting the allies in order to understand this in the same way and, and really hopefully pushing to make these changes. But as of now, I would say that we really haven't had much of, uh, of success in that level. And frankly, it stood in the way. It's caused a lot of programs to have funding cuts and lose funding. It's, you know, when you view us as a program, then when budgets get tight, it's easy to cut a program as opposed to an approach. So it's caused a lot of problems and hopefully in the next few years, we'll see that change. So the next question is um, from Joy. Okay, well, how about Tom Scott? Tom, do you wanna ask your question? Sure, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I saw that Cure Violence is built off of 20 years of development and it's clearly evidence-based, but evidence in criminology and psychology are, is always growing. And especially when you expand a new target populations that maybe wasn't based on the development of cure violence, like cartel violence in South America. I'm curious how you continue to keep evidence driving the cure violence model. Um, do you have a board of subject matter experts that you rely on? I guess, how do you incorporate the evidence as it continues to grow? Yeah, I mean, it's cure violence is, um, we uh, often say we're an organization that has a small foot, but a big footprint. Um, and so I think a lot of what you're saying is, um, it's my vision for what I want to happen. Uh, where we're continually getting together, looking at studies and, and, and making improvements. Uh, but the reality is, is it's, it's a bit more of a build it as you fly or, or you know, improve it as you fly sort of thing. Um, and it, you know, part of this is because this is a new field that violence as a health issue, addressing violence as a health issue, outreach, you know, outreach work has been around a while, but it's not been a large field. And so there haven't been a lot of national convenings specifically and things like this that can really drive the field and advance the literature. There's not been a lot of funding for research on these kinds of approaches. I mean, we've had seven evaluations, so you, so you might get the idea that there's a ton of uh, funding out there, but it's because that's been a priority of ours, that we've really, really pushed to get funding. And it's been, uh, it's been a struggle. We've had to put a lot of effort into getting these evaluations done, getting the funding for them. So there hasn't been as much opportunity to learn as um, we'd like, but still I think a lot of these, what they end up doing is um, they allow us to kind of ask questions and make adjustments. And I, what we see is a lot of changes at the local level. And where, like, for instance, where I've seen this the most is in New York City. Um, you know, they have the most recent US evaluation and you know, they had a lot of findings around 
Uh, and they also worked with the evaluation team very closely. So I think they, they learned a lot and there were a lot of findings that they're looking to implement. And you know, things around, you know, around the survey that they found, uh, specifically surveys of staff. And so I think they're trying to build a lot more around support services for staff and sort of uh, other types of support services for clients as well. And so, you know, those are some examples of some things that we're learning, but this, the whole field needs a lot more funding and we need convenings and we need research partners. Um, and right now it just kind of seems uh, like we've, uh, um, we're just trying to get as much, trying to get it as we can, but it's, it's a struggle. And, and actually I saw something that, that referred to older studies. I mean, there has not been a lot of funding in the last two, three years studying this approach or other approaches. So it's been a real struggle. So Daniela, um, Daniela's question, I think piggybacks in some ways off of Scott's uh, or Tom Scott's question. Daniel, do you want to um, offer your question? Hi, thank you very much. Yes, I'm from Mexico and I've studied the cure violence um, models already. And I would be interested to know how it's being adapted to the context of Mexico and also Latin America in general. You did mention at the beginning of the presentation that the nature of violence in Latin America is uh, vastly different from that in the United States. So um, I'm keen to, to learn more about how to adapt and expand this program. Thank you. Yeah, um, I appreciate that question. Um, I, I mean, our, uh, my colleague uh, uh, Lupe Cruz is, is really the expert here. And if she is with me, I turn it over to her because um, this is what she focuses on. But uh, I'll tell you what I know, what I've learned from her. Um, I mean, first of all, in terms of like how it's different, um, so first of all, some of the differences that we see at a local level is first of all, I think the poverty, uh, the, the lack of opportunities is, is just at a different level. Um, and, and I mean, and this is especially true recently with the, um, the hurricane that affected Honduras and other, other events, you know, COVID like you know, is, is really affecting these communities. So. Yeah, I, I think we're dealing with a different situation in, in terms of that. And that also means that there's fewer services and resources available for people to refer people to. Um, I, you know, we also are dealing with cartels, which are a bit different than, than gangs. Uh, they're more national, they're, they have a different structure. Um, but, uh, and, then, and then the other thing is, is the way that the gangs work is a little bit differently from my understanding in, in Latin America, at least some areas where it's, it's much harder to leave a gang or a cartel and it's, uh, it's um, and so like, you know, whereas in the US we would hire people that used to be with this group or that group. And so therefore they were really credible with that group because everyone knew them. They used, you know, they were used to run together, but like uh, it, you can't do that in Honduras, for example. And so what I know what we do is we hire relatives of people in gangs or, or we hire, um, you know, I think clergy sometimes play this role in certain Latin American communities where they, because of their status as a clergy member, they have influence. So we find what basically what, what I'm saying is we find ways to get people that do have influence that we can hire. And, you know, honestly, I, I know from talking to my colleague, Brent Decker, who did the initial implementation there, uh, you know, he wasn't sure that they were going to be able to implement in Honduras. Uh, they, he went there and I think it was like a 10 day visit or something. And he, up until like seven or eight days into the visit, he didn't think that we were going to go ahead with the program because he didn't think it would work. Um, but then they met some people, they met a partner and they decided that they could make it work. And so they gave it a try. So, yeah, I mean, I think um, those are some of the big differences. Yeah, I know, I know recently too, I, you know, I've heard a story where in, in Juarez, where um, there was somebody who really wanted to work with us um, and he was involved in a cartel, but um, he asked permission of his cartel and, and he was granted permission um, to be able to, to join us and work us, with us as an interrupter. So, you know, there are situations where things like that can happen so that we can get people that with a lot of credibility. And that one individual, my understanding is because of that, his role, his former role, he was really able to stop things and bar as a lot of things because of his, his high credibility. Um, one other thing to mention is uh, in some of the communities, because of the poverty and lack of resources, some of these programs are just violence interrupters. There's not outreach workers. There's no need to have caseloads when you don't have anything to refer them to. Um, and so it's really, they just, 
they're the interrupters, but they're also, you know, they're hanging out with people and, and shifting norms and shifting behaviors in that way. But it's, we just identify them as interrupters rather, rather than outreach workers. So that, those are some of the main differences. So John Rhoda has a question about the role of police. Um, he asks, when violence interrupters are working on a potential major incidence of violent, in, incident of violence, at what point would they reach out to the police? And how do you manage this conflict in order to maintain the interrupter's credibility on the street so that they are not viewed as informants? I... Yeah, that's a great question. So, I mean, um... <sighs> this is something we obviously train in. Uh, you know, we not only train like, you know, what to do in situations like this, but also how to keep yourself safe. If maybe your own day, your own life's at danger, you know, what, how to recognize when things are escalating. Um, I mean, what I would say simply, I guess, to answer this is, first of all, you know, you ask a lot of our inter interrupters and they'll tell you they could, they could, and they can mediate, they could stop any conflict. You know, if they know about it in time, they know how to talk somebody down. They know what to say to them. So you know, that's obviously a lot of boasting, but like uh, on, you know, on, on the part of, you know, you have to have confidence to do this work. And so I think a lot of people have a lot of confidence that they can do that. But, you know, there, I've heard people talk about situations like this and I'll, you know, there, there are ways to let people know without doing things that I think are um, ethically wrong or ethically challenged in terms of how you represent yourself. Uh, you know, you don't have to be telling police officers about individuals, you could tell people about locations. Or you could tell people to look out at a particular time or things, um, or just to just, you know, a lot of times it's just be present in this, in this area, you know, something might, you know, if you're present in this area, it might help out a lot. You know, th those are the ways in which we could say things and do things that aren't compromising our role. Um, and the other thing is, um, you know, our interrupters, they have a role and they have a, you know, they have to maintain that role to be credible and to be safe. Um, but, you know, there's communication that happens at a higher level. The program manager and the, the head of the precinct are talking. Um, so there, there is communication that happens at that level. Um, but that's, you know, that's kind of the limit of it. Okay, I hope you're, you're doing okay, Charles. We have about uh, three, four more questions to go. Um, Lynette, do you want to ask your question? Yeah. Um... It, it, it um, is obvious that um, in the U.S. there's a level of tolerance um, for police violence. I'm originally from the U.K. and um, um, there is very little tolerance for any kind of violence um, from police officers there. Um, society looks really poorly on that. Um, there's a standard that's expected. What kind of work can we do to um, view police violence for what it is? It's no different than violence from anyone else. It's still violence. How can we change that culture and that um, way that society views it as acceptable? Yeah, I mean, first of all, I would say um, it really helps to take care of some of the tough problems before police have to be involved. Like when you can put outreach workers in there on the street corners that instead of it having to be dispersed roughly by police, it could be dispersed by outreach workers. Or when you have a something that you expect to happen and you can put a violence interrupter who can stop it, you know, that, that saves a police officer from having to get involved in a situation that threatens their life that they might react in certain ways or be more likely to react in certain ways. So you know, I think there's, there's a lot to be said with changing the circumstances in which police have to respond. So re responding to violence can help a lot. Uh, but in terms of like specifically police violence and what is happening, we, what we're all seeing and what has been there for a very long time. Um, I mean, first of all, I'd point out that violence is contagious. The problems that we're seeing in police departments, it's a contagious problem. It's a problem of norms, it's a problem of behaviors, and it's a problem of exposure and trauma. I think police officers a lot of times deal with things either on the, in, in the line of work. There's been a lot of studies about officer trauma and their behavior because of it, uh, behavior in their homes and behavior in the streets. And I mean, so I mean, we have to deal with this, first of all, as a health problem. Uh, we have to recognize that officers, there's a lot of officers that need treatment. They need healing. They need to address their trauma. 
they need to address, you know, some, for some of them, it might be a long held trauma from their childhood or more. Um, the second, you know, but, yeah, but I think secondly, you know, we can also address this as an epidemic health problem like you would in the community. Um, we've been trying to do this. We've had a lot of conversations with uh, different departments. And the way you would do it is the same way that you would do it in the streets. You would hire credible messengers. So that would either be current or former police officers. Uh, and you would have people have roles of, you know, roles of training people, roles of shifting norms, roles of identifying the problem people and doing things to change their behavior. Um, so yeah, you can address this problem in exactly the same way. And we would love to work on this if there's a, a community and department that would do it. Thank you, Lynette. Mark Connolly. You know, I, I didn't have a question, but I'm with UNICEF in Honduras. We've partnered with Cure Violence in Jamaica and here in Honduras. And just on a couple of the questions that came up, I think it's important to recognize that I, I, I smile when I hear Christopher and others talk about, oh, well, we only, we're below 10 in homicides. I only work in 40 and above homicide countries. And the violence interrupters really, they're just reducing homicides. If, if violence goes down in the community, we're lucky. Crime never goes down in the community. So it's very, very focused. But we've had a big success here in Honduras on reducing femicides. And that's because as Charles said earlier, um, we can't get too many of the MS-13 gang guys to join us because they can never leave the gang. But they left behind a lot of widows and sisters who lost brothers. And so there's a female cadre that's very anti-violence that the gangs in many ways feel sorry for and, and really want to help the sister of the guy they killed. And we found out that the intelligence that flows between female violence interrupters about who's the next female that's gonna get killed is not rocket science. The guys announce it every single day who they're gonna kill. So to reduce femicide, you literally just get the female interrupters to share that intel and then physically move the woman and her kids, not only to a new house, but a new community. But if you look at Live Saved and if you look at appreciation of the communities, uh, that's one of the great lessons learned here in Honduras, how to reduce femicide and everyone comes out alive. Mark, I'm curious, um, that seems to reduce homicides. Does it change norms? Because it just sounds like you're, you're moving the victim, potential victim out of harm's way. What, what leads to norms change? We're, we're, we're struggling on the norm change piece of it. No, we're just literally saving, saving lives. Yeah. female lives. When you, yeah. when you have that intel, you just can't yeah. sit back. You just okay. gotta, you gotta do something. Thank you very much for that. Um, next up is Robert Bailey. And then we have a final question from Demarcus uh, Bell afterwards. Thank you. Um, I appreciate hearing the, um, how the public health uh, perspective on violence is useful for police internally to understand their own behavior. But I'm also curious about the, the extent to which you have worked directly with police departments to try to change their attitudes and approach um, to the people in the community who are the, the victims of violence and or perpetrators of violence. How actively do you work with police and try to partner with them? That's my question. Yeah. So I, I think, I'm, I mean, I mentioned, but I'll go into more detail that the program manager usually has a connection with the head of whatever district or precinct that they're working in. And so that, you know, part of that conversation is helping to educate them about the work that they're doing in the community. And so that's, I mean, frankly, it's, it's being, it's done for the, on the first hand, because it's, um, it's to protect our workers, you know, like there's instances where we have had workers hassled by police officers because police officers don't understand what they're, they just know this person's history and they don't know what they're doing on the street corner, but they know who they're hanging out with and they know their records. So, you know, there's an education of that you have to 
explain to them why this person wearing this jacket is doing this. And you, I know his history, but he's okay. And so there's that kind of education. Um, but in terms of actually shifting the police norms, I mean, it's, um, it would have to be done from the inside. Uh, this is a, any problem of behavior, it, it is much more effective to work it from the inside. And we've had a lot of conversations with the international associations of chiefs of police about putting together things like this. Uh, we design trainings, like outlined them. Um, but yeah, we just haven't gotten the funding for this. So I, I do think that it's possible. And um, yeah, I don't think it'd be that difficult. It's just, it would take some funding to, to do. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Um, DeMarcus, you have a final question. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I, so I just wanted to circle back to some of Professor Smith's earlier comments. Um, and comment on this like large focus on changing the norms of individuals. Um, so as a black man, like I worry about the extent to which uh, this actually entrenches like racialized notions of crime while at once obscuring where my community's harm is actually rooted. Um, you speak about explicitly directing all of your time and resources on the people who are at the highest risk, um, not necessarily on the people with drug problems, not necessarily on the people who need a job, but I'm wondering how your health lens could be expanded uh, to be inclusive of the social determinants of health and additionally work to cure the conditions of structural violence um, and some of those upstream factors like access to housing, employment, economic stability, you know, whose absence we know invariably causes violence and harm. Um, if, you know, we, to, to look no further, you can look at the suburbs to see where, where these kinds of places <laughs> exist. Um, so on a practical and, and ethical level, I'm wondering like when you encounter people with these needs, like to what extent does your approach um, pair with organizations and programs and communities that seek to actually provide people with th those wraparound services that actually shift the, ma the material conditions of people um, and that create healthy communities and safety? Thanks for your question. I mean, I think first of all, um, the first step in establishing a, a, a program site once you've hired the workers, once you have the, the organization identified that's doing the work, is really to assess the particular program sites. And so you're really getting a reading of what you have in that community available. Um, and so, you know, our program managers, our outreach workers, they're in touch with the different services, they're in touch with employers who are hiring, they're in touch with uh, whatever, it, you know, they have, there's a list of things that their clients might need. And so they know where to get those, each of those things. And so, you know, it's not as if people come to our offices and we turn people away, we're not gonna deal with you. Um, you know, we are holding events where we invite partners, we invite social service providers. You know, we are having, um, you know, giving opportunities for people to learn. I mean, these are embedded community organizations who have been doing this work for a long time. And so a lot of times the organization's doing cure violence, but they're doing, a dozen other things as well. And so it's, it's incorporated into the work that they're doing as, as a whole. Um, but, you know, I, I would just, I, I think the thing that is needed most to address what you're talking about is, is more capacity at the local level, that we need to invest in the community organizations that can address all these other problems that you're talking about. Um, and right now there's, there's not that investment on for violence or on for these other issues. There's, there's not much investment at all. So it's a, a lack of an investment that we're seeing. And so I think all that I'm saying by focusing on violence is because we only have seven outreach workers, we have to focus those seven workers on the issue of violence and only work with the people who are most likely to be violent. And um, if we had 20 outreach workers, so if we had 40 outreach workers, we can obviously specialize a lot more and that's what we would do, be doing too. It wouldn't be, um, you know, just having 40 outreach workers who are all kind of trying to do the same thing. It would be, you'd have job placement experts, you'd have drug treatment counselors, you'd have mental health counselors, you would have all of this either in-house or you'd have the partnerships set up. But, you know, when I'm talking about focusing only on violence, it's because there isn't this investment in this other stuff there isn't the, the staffing of other outreach workers who can specialize. So if we can only focus on one thing, what is the one most important thing? Violence is the most important thing. It harms the most people. 
it spreads the harm, it, it, it hurts a number of different sectors of a community. Um, and so it's, it's not because I want to ignore these other things. I want to address all of them, um, but it's a matter of focus uh, with limited resources all. Thank you very much for that. <clears throat> After, I mean, I already, already had a great deal of respect for Cure Violence, um, but then to hear you talk about the program and, and all of what is needed to fall into place, the level of commitment on the ground, the outreach workers, the, the um, interveners, is that the correct term? I forget. Um, in order to, for it to be a success, and yet you're reaching such high levels of success in so many different um, contexts, it's extraordinary and very clearly has to be a part of a broader set of solutions. Um, thank you so much for joining us this late afternoon and sharing with us about um, care violence. And I look forward to watching to see how this um, develops in other parts of the globe as well. Thank you, Charles. My pleasure, anytime. Thanks very much for having me.